Hi, this is Daryl Meyer from Keller, Texas. Today is Thursday, December 27th, 2012. You know, there's so many things going on in the world today that show us that we are indeed living in those times of the end that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21. Here's, here's case in point. And just so there's no confusion, I want to make sure you understand this channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I will be preaching to you, Christ and Him crucified as being the only way to God the Father. Here's a story out of Prophecy News Watch. It says Christianity is close to extinction in the Middle East. Christianity faces being wiped out of the biblical heartlands in the Middle East because of mounting persecution of worshipers according to a new report. The study warns that Christians suffer greater hostility across the world than any other religious group. Isn't that amazing? Not really when you think about it. I mean the world is pretty much run by the prince of this world, Satan, and so many seem to give in to his charms and, and what he offers and they go against God's people in a hard way. The story goes on to say it claims politicians have been blind to the extent of violence faced by Christians in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and coming soon to a country near you, I'm sure. The most common threat to Christians abroad is militant Islam. Well, big shock there, right? It says claiming that oppression in Muslim countries is often ignored because of fear that criticism will be seen as racism. Racism? against Muslims when they can be Arabs, English, German, Indian. How is criticism against Islam racism at all when it's not a race but a cult? It warns that converts from Islam face being killed in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Mauritania, and Iran and risk severe legal penalties in other countries across the Middle East. The report by think tank Savitas says it's generally accepted that many faith-based groups face discrimination or persecution to some degree. A far less widely grasped fact is that Christians are targeted more than any other body of believers. It cites estimates that 200 million Christians or 10 percent of Christians worldwide are soci socially disadvantaged, harassed, or actively oppressed for their beliefs. Exposing and combating the problem ought in my view to be political priorities across large areas of the world. This is not the case, tells us much about the questionable hierarchy of victimhood, says the author Rupert Short, a journalist and visiting fellow of Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. So Christians being persecuted. Let me tell you something. It's going to get worse the closer we get to the return of Christ. And the more we see the enemy at work, the more we need to be at work spreading the good news of the gospel of Christ, the truth, because the devil's out there spreading lies like crazy. A lot of things going on in Syria. Here's something out of Haaretz. Um, U.S. preparing to intervene in Syria. In an interview with Israel Radio, government minister Moshe Ya'alan said that the U.S. was preparing to intervene in Syria. A final decision on intervention will come if and when the Syrian army begins using chemical weapons against its own citizens. Great, just what we need. Another war for Americans. Seems like we're always the police around the world. Always the ones jumping in to help try to save some other country. When ours is going downhill fast. Here's another report out of Israel today. Israel operating in Syria and the U.S. preparing to join. Various Western Arab and Israeli media reports have been claiming for over a month now that Israeli special forces are on the ground in Syria in an effort to keep tabs on its chemical weapons stockpile. Now the biggest reason I'm watching Syria is because of the Isaiah 17 1 prophecy that says Damascus will be destroyed and it won't exist as a city and we're seeing so many things I think that are leading up to this and it just seems to keep building and something new comes into the media nearly monthly, weekly, those chemical weapons, should Bashar Assad use them, would be his downfall because then he would probably get the brunt force of not only Israel but the United States as well. I just wonder what Russia would do on the other side when that happens, or Iran for that matter. Whew. Let's get into the word. Now, yes, today I'm making a shorter video than normal. 
I've got a crazy schedule today and just had this small amount of time to be able to get this in here but I I like to make sure the daily word goes out I, I want to make sure people hear the good news of the gospel of Christ as often as possible how can you have a clear conscience before God Galatians 1 9 and 10 says as we have said before so now I say again if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received let him be accursed for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know, I I know this man who became this pastor at a little church in a southern suburban community. He was pretty young, but the pastor before him had been there for close to 30 years. But the problem was, the previous pastor preached a lot of these feel-good sermons, but never quite got around to telling people about Jesus. You know these kind of preachers are just oh you know God wants you to be blessed he wants you to have abundance you know you know you know the type so at the end of service one day with this new preacher a lady walked up to this new young pastor and, and told him I don't like your preaching style you're too direct and all you ever talk about is Jesus it's like you're preaching a different gospel <laughs> well the truth is he probably was preaching a different gospel the real one and while people loved his teaching, there were several people who wanted him to go back to the good old days of, of not being challenged, not being told you're a sinner in need of a savior. They rather liked the sermons where they were being pat on the back for, for being good Christian churchgoers and, and uh, faithful givers and things like that. Now, we're not supposed to be abrasive or offensive. Well, yeah, maybe we are offensive to some, but we shouldn't be abrasive to get attention about the gospel but when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ we need to preach it boldly okay God doesn't give us a spirit of fear or timidness but of boldness and we're to tell the world about our Lord and Savior no matter how bad the persecution gets and to me the more Christians get persecuted the stronger that makes me feel that I want to make sure the good news goes out and I don't care what man might do to me. I'm not worried about what man's going to do to me. If we could just save one person from the fires of hell for eternity, then it's all worth it. And while some people will tune you out because they don't like the message you're telling them, they don't want to hear there's only one way to God the Father, you know, that always amazes me. Some people are offended that there's only one way to God the Father. And they get mad about it. I'm like, thank you, God, for showing us the way, telling us that it's only through the blood of Christ that we'll be saved. But you'll have a clear conscience before the Lord. Who are you here to please, God or man? Brother, your answer better be God. And we need to stay faithful to the word and make sure other people hear it. Let's talk about Jesus being sentenced to death in Matthew 27, verse 24 through 26. About verse 26, it says, Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Now, ultimately, Pontius Pilate doesn't believe that Jesus wants to supplant the Caesar and destroy the Roman Empire as an Israelite king. There are several factors that explain why he finds no fault in Jesus, Matthew 27, verses 11 through 23. First, whether through outside sources or, or through his own intuition, Pilate sees that Caiaphas... And the other leaders seek Jesus' death out of envy, not the truth. Secondly, his wife has had a nightmare about these events transpiring in verse 19 and sees involvement in the death of Jesus as being disastrous for Pilate. And finally, the response of Jesus himself to his accusers strongly refutes their accusations. John's Gospel tells us that at one point in the trial, our Savior assures Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world and therefore not interested in the violent overthrow of Caesar. And coupled with this, Jesus' appearance before Pilate bound and beaten, which likely convinced him that the Nazarene is no real threat to the empire. Jesus' innocence, though, makes Pilate no less willing to give in to his fear of a riot and have Jesus crucified to prevent an uprising. This kind of compounds his guilt. To commit the great sin of executing the Lord of glory, Pilate must cast justice aside. The gathered mob is not 
excuse for demanding Christ's death simply because they're following their leaders. But if in this mob there are those who once hailed Jesus as David's heir, why do they follow along? It's, it's because they want a violent conqueror and their expectations cannot accept that this man bound is God's Messiah. Barabbas is willing to overthrow Rome by any means necessary, Mark 15, verse 7. So the people prefer him over the humble Jesus. Pilate tries to shift the blame to the crowd, and tragically the crowd's acceptance of responsibility for Jesus' death has been used over the, sin over the centuries to justify anti-Semitism. A lot of professing Christians have, have brought blood upon Jewish people, a terrible misuse of the text given that Jesus and his disciples are Jewish and that the crowd is speaking for itself, not an entire ethnic group. In reality, though, all people are guilty of having Christ killed because our sin made his death necessary in the first place. Romans 3, 21 through 26 tells us this. So every person who's ever lived on the face of the earth is responsible for the death of Christ, not just the Jews. That's pretty much all of us, people. Bible's clear, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we need a Savior. There's a select group of these corrupt religious leaders and unjust Roman officials. Are those who enacted the legal procedures that resulted in Jesus' death? Yet, in a sense, we're all guilty. We're all responsible for the death of Christ. It's kind of sobering to realize that we put Jesus on the cross with our sins, but he went there willingly so that we could be forgiven of our sin. And that's how amazing God's marvelous grace is. Be a witness, not a judge. John 16, 8, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You know, it, it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to reprove sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's not our ministry. We're simply witnesses. A witness is not the judge or the jury. Okay, A witness simply relates what he's experienced, providing evidence to the truth of something. We're to witness in word and deed okay, to the truth of Jesus being alive in us and let God be the one who convicts. Okay, We need to plant the seeds, let God nurture it, water it, fertilize it, and make it grow. We're, we simply testify to what we have seen or what's happened to us. You know, some people in their zeal have gone beyond the witness stage and have tried to bring people under conviction themselves. That's not our job. This is assuming the job that belongs to the Holy Spirit alone. You know, this not only frustrates the witness, but it drives a lot of people away from God. Yes, we need to be bold, but we also need to be gentle and use the love of Christ. We make a very poor Holy Spirit. <laughs> because we're in this flesh. So we should stick to our job of being a witness and let the Holy Spirit do his job. You know, Jesus specified an orderly progression in the way we should witness. First we start in Jerusalem, or where we are. Then we go to those nearby, like Judea. Finally, we take the gospel to every religious and racial group, Samaria, throughout the world. There are some very practical reasons for becoming witnesses like this. Jesus testified that a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown among his family and friends. Typically, at home is the hardest place to witness. With your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, your sons and daughters. Starting with those who know us best will cause us to humble ourselves and give God all the glory. And also, when rejection comes, this helps temper us in our witness so that we'll be more effective and more resilient when we go to the outermost parts of the earth. So don't let persecution and people calling you names get you down. Use that to strengthen yourself and have a godly heart. Read Psalm 37 verses 1 through 8. You know, the Lord promises to give us the desires of our heart. But a lot of people take this passage out of context, forgetting that their own mindset plays a very vital part in bringing this to fruition. You know, it's been said, where your mind goes, your feet go. So be careful what you think about. What's your responsibility when it comes to claiming promises from God? First, you need to delight yourself in the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 4. You know, Christians should rejoice in God and desire to walk in obedience. The Lord must have first place in your life before you can claim the promises in this verse. Number two, commit your way to the Lord. Verse 5. You know, allow God to change any aspect of your ambition that's not according to His will. I've had to do that. 
for 25 years I was a professional actor seeking my own glory then one day I realized you know I don't like this scene I don't like the people that are involved in this business and then I realized that God was training me up to give him the glory remember he doesn't always answer a prayer the way you want him to and it's for a reason number three trust in him verse five God is merciful he's all-knowing he's kind he's generous you can trust him with all your hopes all your dreams all your desires number four you need to rest in him verse seven resting in the Lord means trusting in him to answer your prayers in his timing or transform your aspirations so they conform to his will not ours number five wait upon the Lord patiently verse 7 Jesus waited three decades before beginning his three and a half year ministry on earth according to his example waiting is one of the key principles of Christian living so do your desires align with God's purpose and plan for your life you know he wants to give his followers abundant blessings and fullness of joy and fullness of life so allow your dreams to be conformed to the Lord's will and follow his guidance faithfully only when you surrender him to God will you experience God's best for your life Listen, you guys have a great day. I love you tremendously. God bless you, guide you, be with you always, and good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.